just give you a flavor for what I'm, I'm going to try to do today. And uh, I'd like this to be a discussion. I'd like everyone who has, um, well, let me, just, let me tell you what I'm going to do today, not give you the preamble. So, um, why is this not working? Why is my screen not progressing? There we go. So, in the last two meetings, uh, SuperTai discussed voting. And to understand voting, we had to understand, so we're trying to understand voting, but we had to understand sparsity. We had to understand active dendrites. We had to understand not the reference frames, but the temple memory algorithm, the layer cell. And pretty much everything that we discussed in those last two meetings or stuff that we, we've implemented. Uh, we had code, we've tried it out, we've experimented, we've done some empirical testing with it. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about the stuff we don't know. <laughs> so I'm gonna look at the overall theory, focusing on what is missing, what we haven't implemented, or haven't figured out yet. Some of the stuff we know pretty clearly what it has to do. We just don't know, we haven't done it. Some, play, some of the stuff we don't know how to do it. Some of the stuff we just were clueless. Some of it's dynamically changing. So that's the overall picture. Um, there's a lot of material I have, not a lot of slides, but a lot of material. And um, it'd be really best as we did in the last two meetings, if you are confused by something, don't understand the word I'm using or something like that, just jump in, interrupt, there's no point going forward if we're not all understanding the same terminology. Um, so if we don't get it through it today, we don't get through it today, but ho hopefully we can. We'll see. Uh, I, I'm going to be talking again mostly from a biological point of view, not that, um, that if we want to implement any things, we have to do it that way. Um, I'll try, I'll try to remove some of that, but I haven't been able to remove all of it. So any questions before I get to jump into it? I'll count to three. <laughs> okay, we'll just go. Um, I thought I'd go somewhat sort of chronologically through um, this thought experiment and then two papers we've written and use those as the basic framework for the conversation. So you're all familiar with this thought experiment of touching the fingers of the coffee cup. Um, this was a real eye opener for me. It was a big, big deal because a lot of things became clear that. I, just I never knew before. And I'll just list them here. Um, what it told us, and, and I'm not saying all these things we understood right at the front. It's, in the end, this is a summary of things we've learned from it. Um, a single column uh, knows the location of a central patch relative to the object. So that was, that was the basic insight. Like, you know, when your, your finger knows what it's going to sense, uh, and therefore it knows, it needs to know where, it's gonna, where it is relative to the object that it's sensing. In order to, to know where it is, it has to have some sort of reference frame that's attached to the object. And you know, otherwise, how would, how would you represent that? It has to have some representation for that. We also knew that path integration is occurring because as you move your finger um, relative to the object, again, not even looking at it, just moving, you, you could predict in advance what you're gonna feel, therefore you have to be able to predict in advance where your finger is gonna be. So there's some sort of path integration that's occurring uh, there. This idea that there was a reference frame attached to an object in a single column was a revelation for me. It's like, oh, I never even occurred to it. If you ask people like, oh, the reference frames in the brain, sure. Um, all over the place, we knew they had to solve all kinds of motor problems. So, but the idea that every single column had this was, was the thing that was surprising to me. Um, and then we quickly infer that you can, given this information, you know where the finger, the finger knows where it is relative to the object and it's sensing different things. And a column can learn a, a three-dimensional model by integrating location and sensation over time. I say ND because I, I don't think it's restricted to three dimensions. It can learn whatever it is, but we'll think of it as three dimensional objects. And, and again, following Mount Kessel's uh, hypothesis, which is sort of bedrock for us, every column, cortical column is doing the same thing. This means every cortical column works this way. So all of a sudden we had this idea that every cortical column has these reference frames and is integrating over time. And um, that is gonna be the basis for everything, not just touch and seeing, but language and high level thought, even if we didn't understand that yet, but these were gonna be components of that. So the first paper we wrote about this was the Columns paper, which came out in October, 2017. And the Columns paper made two major claims. I mentioned this the other day. Um, the first major claim was that every, each and every column was complete models. Um, this is something that I don't think anyone had thought about before. Um, maybe they did, but we're not aware of it. 
Uh, to me, it was a really big idea. And it's really why we had to get the paper out there, even though our model for how this worked was very impoverished, as you'll see in a moment. So what we proposited in that paper was that um, columns have a reference frame to represent the location of its sensor relative to the object being observed. Um, the columns learn and infer by movement. We model that using our temporal memory neural circuit, which we discussed the other day, and see what they talked about. Um, and that this model is captured 3D structure of an object. And um, we propose the model is basically set, a set of, set of features at location. Uh, we now know this is not right, but that's what we put in the paper. I don't think we, we knew there were problems with it back then, but we didn't know that it wasn't right. Um, we'll talk about what, how we think it is working now later. The second big idea we introduced in the columns paper was the voting between columns. Um, and this, this uh, it solved a whole bunch of mysteries. The two primary ones were the stability of perception. And again, when you're looking at the world, you're not aware your eyes are moving. Bruno Alshausen once said to me, he says, you know, if you can solve the stability perception problem, you know, that deserves a Nobel Prize. Uh, when he recently understood that we did this, he goes, huh, that's pretty interesting. But I didn't remind him what he said earlier. <laughs> um, and um, it also explained so many of these connections that we see in the cortex that are, we, I'll call them lateral. They're just, they're, these are these non hierarchical connections and they go all over the place and, and, and there was no explanation for them. Um, and so uh, these are two big ideas that the voting uh, implemented. Um, so those are the big, two big things we posed in this paper. There are a lot of shortcomings of both the theory and the simulation that we, this paper included simulation. So let me just walk down through these. I'm not, I, I tried to be inclusive here to capture everything, but I probably didn't. So, um, but there's a lot. So we didn't know how neurons could represent reference frames and locations. We, we, when we wrote the paper, we had absolutely no idea. Um, so what we did in the paper, we said, okay, we'll just, we'll just assign random SDRs to locations and use those. Uh, and at the very end of the paper, we kind of, we kind of knew that when we were about to submit it, we knew that, oh, you know, maybe these grid cells are doing this. So we hinted that grid cells could provide the answers. It was in the paper, but we didn't talk about it much. I think we learned along the way, really, I, I can even remember the day Lewis came in and told me about it, um, is that we, we never even considered initially the problem of orientation of the sensor. So when you touch the, the cup, what you feel is depending on the orientation of the finger, it's not just the location. You can rotate your finger around that point and you'll feel different things and we can predict that. And so there's this concept of orientation of the sensor that also has to go under path integration. Um, and you need, to comp you need to know about the orientation of the sensor in order to make predictions. And we didn't have that anywhere in the paper. Uh, I think we might've mentioned at the end, I don't remember, but uh, we, we certainly learned this later. Uh, so that was a big hole. Uh, at this time, we knew that objects were composed of other objects. That was something that, you know, it's kind of been known for a long time, but it's not heavily discussed in neuroscience. Um, and this, this model didn't have anything to do with that. This is point number three. This basically said, hey, an object is just a set of features at locations. And it had no concept of like, those features may not be features, they may be other objects. And so there may be objects related that locations relative to other objects. So we didn't have that now. We also knew that objects had to have behaviors, meaning that they, they, um, they, they, we have to learn how they morph over time, how they change you know, when we interact with them, how they move on their own. The examples we, of course, have used like staplers and doors and smartphone apps and things like that. Um, that's all part of how object modeling, and there was no concept of that in this paper. Um, a really, really big hole, number four here, uh, is it didn't work with vision. It kind of glanced over it and sort of pretended it worked with vision, but it really didn't because the problem with the vision is the sensor is at a distance. Your, your retina is not touching the object. With the finger on the coffee cup, we can say, yeah, the location of the finger is in the reference frame of the coffee cup. That's where the sensation is. We can just record that. But with, with, uh, with your eyes, it's not like that. There's a gap between them and there's a variable distances and, and, and the movements is more complicated because when you move your eyes, it's how it moves in the reference frame of the cup is different. So we really, we, uh, I'll call that problem the sensor at a distance problem. You can also see it in touch if you're like holding a tool in your hand. 
And you know, you're using a tool as opposed to your finger. You can you can sort of do all the things you can do with your finger. Um, and yet your know, finger's no now longer at that at the location. So that's number four. Um, number five relates to the um, to the orientation issue is that we talked about voting and representing uh, object ID. Um, but, but we know that we perceive not just the object ID. When I touch something or look at something, I don't just see, oh, it's a coffee cup. I know its location and its orientation relative to me. And so it's, uh, those are things that have to be resolved as well. So voting, you know, we have to vote. Those things have to be resolved. They're going to be resolved by voting. So voting was incomplete. We just talked about object ID. There was no uh, mention of how motor generation uh, could be used to solve goals. You know, uh, and um, and then there was I, I've I've used the word transfer learning here, and I'm, I'm afraid to do that because I know it means something in machine learning, and it probably means something completely different in machine learning. <laughs> so this is the term that we were using the other day for disjoint pooling, is what we used in the past. Let me just explain what it is, um, and uh, and then I'll stop for questions. So one of the problems with this model is I can reach into a, a black box and I can feel this coffee cup and I learn a model of the coffee cup. And you say, great, this column learns a model of the coffee cup. But now I can, I can say, I can learn a bunch of objects that way using my index finger in my right hand. But now I can reach into a box with a bunch of objects and I can touch it with my finger in my left hand and I'll be able to infer those objects. I'll be able to say, yep, this is, a, this is the object A and this is object B. Even I learned it with my right hand or I could do it with my toe. Um, I could put my toe in the box and rub it around the coffee cup and figure out what it is. Or, you know, I can do any part of my body. And of course, this goes across modalities as well. Um, when, um, if I learned what the several objects look, you know, felt like with my finger, but I never saw them, and then I show them to you, you'd be able to very quickly determine which, which was which, even though, so how did the cortical columns that get vision, um, you know, know the model that was learned by the finger? Uh, this is a real, this is a really, really difficult problem for a long time. I, unfortunately, I think we know the answer now. So <laughs> just came recently, but this was really puzzling. Um, how it is that knowledge about a mod object model um, was learned in one set of columns, uh, but we know that the other columns have to be able to um, uh, be able to use that model or have their own model or something like that. So that's what I mean by transfer learning in this case. Um, and I don't know if it's the same as other people use it. So why don't I stop here for a second and see if, if there's questions about um, any of this so far. Or comments or additions. Marcus, <laughs> super tight. <laughs> You're welcome to chime in. Did people understand what Jeff went through? Did some of these points? I'm not sure if everyone understood all these points. Yeah, I don't know either. So I'm, I'm pretty confident everyone did not understand. All of <laughs> well, <laughs> there's I, someone I out there who did not I'll understand give, one of these points. You get brownie points by being the first person to say you don't understand something. Okay, Jeff, number I, six. I what do you mean by motor generation? Uh, what do I mean by motor generation? Um, every column in the cortex has uh, has a, has cells that generate behaviors. All right, and they're in layer five. Um, and they, every column has them, as far as we know. And so uh, it's not that these are just inference engines. These are inference motor generation engines. You know, the, the, the columns create my speech. Columns make your fingers move. Columns make your eyes move. So we didn't talk about that uh, uh, at all. We just talked about how a column could, could use incoming, um, you know, sensory data and movement data to learn objects and infer objects, but not to achieve any goals not to, why would it, what would a column do when it's generating motor behavior? Why would it do it? And how does it do it? That's what I meant. But clear, Kevin? So are you talking about uh, directed motion to uh, explore the space? And to, we didn't, to solve I, I said goals? we had nothing. There was nothing in this paper. There was, there was, there was it just a, it's a fact that every column has motor output. So visual columns can make the eyes move. And the somatic right, columns make, I, I, make your fingers move. We didn't talk about that in this paper. No, I understand that's the lack of the paper. I, I'm trying to get to what you, uh, well, ultimately, what we have motor talked generation about every, as, a, as an integral concept means well, to Well, everything, picture. just think about all the things your neocortex does through movement. We have to explain that, right? It generates 
It generates speech, it types on computers, it opens doors, it, you know, cooks on the stove. I mean, we do okay. all these things. And, you know, ultimately, we have to explain all that. Um, so okay. I, I don't want to get it. In, yeah, it could be exploration, too. You know, I'm trying to not go down to that level of detail. Right now. Just it's a big black hole. We didn't talk about motor generation. Okay. Someone else Jeff, in, the, in the um in the columns paper, you talk about uh, voting between columns, and then under that, you listed that explains the stability of perception. I didn't, um, I don't understand how voting explains stability there. Could you explain that part? Okay, that's that's a big thing. Um, I'm glad you brought it up because that's really important. We did cover this the last two days, so um, so we really need to do it again. Um, remember, in the in the conversation we had the last meeting, we were talking about voting for object ID. So um, you can see this in the upper right hand picture here. Um, and that um, there was a, a set of cells that represent the, uh, the object, the coffee cup. And as your finger moves, the input to the finger would change, its location on the coffee cup would change, but the object ID would not change, right? It's still the coffee cup. It's not, it's not a different object, it's because your finger is moving and sensing something different. So if I have a representation for the object, um, that it will be stable. And we talked about voting, how multiple columns can reach the same conclusion. And so they're all gonna be saying it's a coffee cup because they voted to get there. Um, and that, and they're all, those cells are gonna be stable. They're, meaning they're not changing their activity. If I look at them, the same cells are gonna be active from moment to moment as the finger moves. Whereas the cells that represent the input from the finger and the location of the finger will be changing. You follow that so far, Karan? Yeah, got it. Now, this is important. I'll come back to this point later. You are only able to perceive, consciously are able to perceive the voting. That is, you can say, I am seeing a coffee cup, but you're, you're not aware that your individual columns are whacking all over the place, you know, changing on and off as they move, as your eyes are scanning over this thing. You know, it's incredible activity, but you're just not conscious of it. It's not available to you. It, it, that activity is locked up inside the columns. And the only thing you're aware of, what is spread out beyond that in, in the voting signal. So your perception, what you perceive is stable, uh, even though the activities of most of the column, the cells in the columns are not stable. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, other questions? That was good. I'm glad you brought that, that up. That's, that, a, that's basic a what? Idea. What's the how? What's the how? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, it's, I mean, there, there are a lot of uh, civility perception, you know, extends, you know, there, uh, a lot of places like, you know, the fact that we, we sample the space and we have a percept that, you know, the, the world is stable rather than staccato. So I'm, when you say the voting is, is stable, uh, that that's saying that's the what it's like okay I've got an ID the ID doesn't change but yeah. it's still remains to me okay how how is that stability generated okay we Subutai went through this um, last and I'll I'll try to do it again Subutai pick jump in but we did discuss this so this is really good we're picking these things up I'm not saying this say hey how come you didn't learn it it's because these are hard concepts and it's hard to learn them so we have to do it multiple times. Remember that, think about a layer of cells in, in the cortex is representing the identity of the object. So it's just one layer of cells. There might be 5,000 cells and we're picking a random, an SDR to represent the coffee cup. And so maybe 100 of those cells are active out of 5,000. So in, in this diagram, that's this object layer up there. Yeah. Yep. So we now have, we have each column, we have a, a, a hundred cells active that represent coffee cup. If I was touching something else, it'd be a different pattern of activity. Those cells are self-reinforcing. Remember, too, because I talked about how they, how the dendrites, the, the remote dendrites or the distal dendrites on those cells connect to the other cells that are active. And so they're self-reinforcing. They want all, they, they're, they're happy to, you know, it's a self-reinforcing group. And they're like, yep, we're all, when we, when we think it's a coffee cup, we're all gonna be reinforcing each other. They will also reinforce the coffee cup uh, uh, SDR in other columns nearby or far away. And so it's, it's a mutually reinforcing uh, mechanism where if they get input from 
Uh, well, basically, that's it. It's a self. It's a it's a cell assembly in the old language of Heb um, that that reinforces itself. I, I don't know if that that's if that's clear um, or not. I guess I, not. I, I guess, I, I, no, <laughs> I guess not. Well, the the I, I I'm just trying to uh, um, cleave two concepts here. Uh, so you have the notion that uh, there are multiple aspects or contributing aspects to an object identity that can come from multiple columns. Um, and then as you get different percepts of that same object, there's a confluence where it says it's still the same object, it's still the same object. Um, so I'm looking at the case where, okay, so I've got a Numenic coffee cup there. It looks like a Numenic coffee cup. You know, it's got Numenic on, it's got the logo and stuff like that. And I rotate it around and suddenly uh, I see uh, a target symbol, like the, like the, like the, uh, the uh, big box store target on the back. Okay, well, that's different. So how does that disrupt all of a sudden my percept well if, if basically what when does an object become something different if you recall yeah. uh Subutai talked about these cells in the voting layer get input from two sources there's a feed forward input which is coming from the column itself this is sensory driven mm -hmm. right it's just like saying oh at this, at this location in this paper we would describe it the following way we'd say at this location there is a feature or a sense thing and um i would represent that and, and that does not fit into the set of sensory feature pairs that we ascribe to the coffee cup. The Meta coffee cup does not have a target logo on it. So if I see the target logo, that is now gonna to try to activate something. It's not gonna reinforce some of the Meta mug. In fact, the, the input to the object layer will be different. It will, be, it will be not be one of the things that belongs there. Um, and it might say, oh, well then this is a, this is a target cup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, re remember the cells, as you're making movements, the cells are predicting what you're going to see based on your model of the object. And yeah. so when you get something different, like a target symbol, the prediction is not going to be correct. So you'll get a burst of activity. Of and so you know that the prediction is incorrect. And so that, that can drive further learning. Okay, so I, I don't want to split hairs, but what, that what, dogs. What, <laughs> no, but, but what I what what I'm, I'm looking at, um, kind of what I don't want you know a, a minor thing like a dust mote to say okay that's not what I expected therefore it's not a coffee cup how how do I how do I set a semantic threshold for when something is different and I, something Kevin, is common. Kevin, I think you're going to get, I'm trying to stick really high level in this diagram, in this talk here today. So okay. I think there, we can always, for every single item that I'm going to talk about, we can dig down and ask very, you know, edge cases and concerns. I think I want to make stick to the high level concepts here. And, and, and it's important we understand the high level concepts um, because this talk is about all the things we don't know. And I, I don't want to like just, I just can't, you know, try to resolve them all right now. So I'm not sure if there's something you're bringing up, which is a fundamental problem or not, but it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like, okay, a mechanism question. Um, it's important that you and everyone understands why the, you know, the basic concept of voting, why it's stable, um, uh, how it is that it's, you know, going between multiple columns and, and why it leads us to, to recognize something with fewer movements of the sensors. These are important concepts. For, the, for right now, it's not important. Actually, it's not even important the mechanism of voting right now. That was that was discussed us today. I don't mind going over it again, but it's not important for what I'm trying to get across today, because um, there's lots of little mechanisms in here. So I want to stick to sort of conceptual ideas here. And if anyone's confused about some conceptual ideas, that would be I want to know that. And we can we can bring offline later, Kevin, questions about like, okay, what's the threshold of difference? You know, <laughs> that's a very well, interesting but very minute question in some sense. I, I guess I, I apologize, but I'm all about mechanism because that's that's how I yeah, you know, yeah. Out how you build so, it. Yeah, so, I understand. But, uh, but, but I understand you don't want to go there right now. So that's, that's yeah, I want to I want to talk about the things we don't know, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, well, not, I, the big the big things we don't know. I mean, really big things okay, we the, don't the, know. So. The big things you don't know. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And and I, I want us all to have sort of a con conceptual framework for like where are we on this process and what things we have left to do. Um, all right. So uh, we have to avoid sort of this. We can talk about mechanism if it helps us get that bigger picture. Other questions that people have. Um, do you have an idea of where in this model attention would come in? We did not talk about that um, at all. I will talk about that later, Vivian. Um, so I didn't mention, I'm, you know, I said this is a list of shortcomings and I said I tried to be inclusive, but I didn't make it inclusive of everything. Well, attention is one of the things I didn't put in there. <laughs> so we'll just put that in the list, number eight, okay? <laughs> attention. Um, because it is, yeah, I, I can do it right now. There we go. Uh, I'll just put attention in there. I didn't want to even to try to describe what attention is. I actually thought about it, Vivian, before. Um, uh, and this list was getting long, and I said, well, it's, it's too long. <laughs> so, okay, there it is. We can, we'll talk about it later in a minute. Uh, anything else? Uh, yeah, so I, maybe this was uh, discussed and I, I just wasn't present, but uh, so you, it says, you say each and every column learns a complete model. So I can imagine that for the coffee cup, that the column would be capable of doing that. But how complex can it be? Like, I can, I can actually imagine I'm, I'm into motorcycles and I can imagine having a complete model for my motorcycle and going over it with my fingers with my eyes uh, closed and sort of making sense of every single thing that I feel. And I cannot imagine that that can be in a single column, right? Well, actually, I think a lot more can be in a single column than you can imagine. Um, because we're gonna move away, first of all, we're gonna move away from the idea that the models are features at locations. That is, that's wrong, as I pointed out. Models are composed of uh, objects relative to other objects. And so now the question is, is how many um, you know, how many compositional objects can a column learn or how many relationships between comp compositional components, right? If, you, if you're into motorcycles and you see a new motorcycle, you don't have to learn what the chain does and you don't have to relearn what the wheels do and you don't have to relearn what the throttle does. You, don't, you know, it, it, these, are, these are concepts you already have and you're just rearranging them again. So in, in our simulations in this, I think it was in this paper. No, I think it was a columns plus paper, maybe. I forget. Um, we, uh, we showed that it, it's very, it was all fake data, it was all made up data, but we showed that a column could learn hundreds of sort of complex objects. Um, it's not that a column can learn everything, it can't. Um, and that's an interesting question, but at the moment, it seems to be much more capable than you might think. And, and we, don't want to, um, we don't want to just say, oh, we can't do this, we have to do it someplace else. We want to understand how it is. Um, just give me one second here. Um, I just want to mute myself for a second. Why is it? Um, one second. Where's my Zoom screen here? It's not at the top. No, you mean it. Yeah, it was in that little bar up there. Um, um, okay. Uh, maybe I can make one point there as well. Um, a very common kind of confusion we get is that even though we're seeing saying that each and every column learns complete models of object, we are not saying that every column learns every object. <laughs> right? It's there's a distributed knowledge here. So every object will have hundreds or thousands of columns that have models of it, but there's you know, let's say a hundred thousand columns. So there's you know uh, ninety nine thousand columns that don't have models of that object. So a, a very, you know, uh, it may be that some parts of your motorcycle are stored in some parts of some set, subset of cortical columns, some other parts of the motorcycle may be in some other parts of the, some other cortical columns. We're not saying that every cortical column has models of every single object that you know. Yeah. Be, yeah. And you get one, one simple break is you can say things like, well, your tactile columns are certainly not, not going to know what the color of the different components are. And uh, in your visual columns, they're not going to know how they feel or their temperature, uh, you know, or how they sound. So there's that division. And there's even within the somatosensory system and the visual system, there would be division as well. 
Um, you know, some visual columns uh, will cover, we talked about different scales and so on. I think, I think I'm very comfortable with the idea that when I say they learn complete objects, what I mean by that, um, you know, is that this goes against the traditional thinking of neuroscience. And there was, nobody in neurosciences I knew of would have said a column in V1 or V2 or even V3 would know what object it, it, it's sensing. They just say, no, that's not possible. Those, uh, those columns are just learning features. They don't really have any concept at all about what the overall bigger picture is. That happening somewhere else in the brain, somewhere else in the neocortex. So the, why I say this is a big idea, that when I say complete models, I'm not saying a column knows everything, like Subutai said. What I'm saying is that this idea is so crazy to most neuroscientists, just that it can learn any kind of model. <laughs> it's, it's like a, you know, it, it just was against every kind of thinking that people were thinking about how sensory information is processed in the cortex. Um, you know, columns just extracted features and somebody else did the recognition. And uh, that's how they viewed it, at least for the, for the several first levels of sensory cortex. So we're saying that's not true. Even a one level V1 system can learn objects and, know, and build three dimensional models. Uh, and, and that is a real, that's why I say this was a big idea. Um, it, 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 no one thought of this. No one would have said a, a column on its own learns a model of anything. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, I got, I got, um, I was uh, alerted to this when you said uh, that you're surprised uh, or that somebody should be surprised that they can feel something with their left hand, let's say, that they learned with their right hand. But then basically that, the, the explanation of Shubutai, that these things are, uh, let's say, in multiple places and somewhat distributed, then, yeah, then then, it, then that would not yeah. be surprising. The, anymore, point, right? the point I brought up under uh, problem number seven was we had no explanation for how, how a column that represented your left hand could learn a model that was only you know, learned by your right hand. Um, there was no explanation for it. It was, it was like we lacked any kind of theoretical mechanistic, any explanation whatsoever for how, how multiple columns, I, you know, I, could learn the I could learn the shape of 25 things with my right finger, but now I can recognize it visually and with all my other parts of my body. How is that? Where is that model stored in a way that you know, or how is it stored? Or how is it transferred? That's what number seven was about. Um, I think no one's surprised that we can recognize something by touching with your left hand after you learned it with your right hand. But it just, where is that model? And how's it done? And how's it get to the left hand? That kind of thing. That was a, that was a sort of different fundamental question. I said it before, that's a really hard problem to solve. <laughs> so it's like, hard me for years. Other questions before I go on? Um, yeah, to, to what you just talked about, um, how much would you say the modeling capability of a single column is impacted by top-down feedback from, from other columns or areas and also lateral feedback? So if you have a column and then you separate it from all the columns around it, would it still be able to model a full object just yeah. from the raw sensory input or does it kind of need the context from everything around or the... Well, yeah, I mean, again, we're, we're theorists here, Vivian. So, you know, we go to extremes on things, right? And then in the real biology, it's much messier than this, of course. Um, but in the theory, we would say a single column is sufficient to learn anything. It can learn, I mean, not anything, but it's sufficient to learn a model of its input. It, it, our, that's how we model it in our simulations. There is no theoretical reason why a single column couldn't learn um, through movement a complete model. It doesn't have to have anything else. The other connections, we've already talked about how we don't know, I'm going to talk about it in a moment, but how transfer learning occurs, because obviously I can learn a model, my left hand can learn a model that my right hand learned, but how did it do that? We, we, haven't, we didn't propose that in this paper, but clearly it can happen. But the theory doesn't say you have to do that. The theory says I can have a one column neocortex and it wouldn't be very interesting, but it would still learn a model of the world and make predictions and, um, and, and that's what it would do. Um, 
And when you talk about things like top down, that's a loaded term. It could mean lots of things. It could be for other regions of the cortex. It could be from, you know, projections subcortically, emotional, you know, things, you know, uh, neuromodulators. I, I don't want to go there, right? We're just from a theory point of view, we're saying, could a column, can a column learn? Yes, it will. And we're arguing, yes, they do. They learn single models. Um, nothing else is required uh, from a theoretical point of view. Biologically, a lot of things are required. Blood is required, energy, you know, <laughs> oxygen, whatever, you know. Um, but, uh, but from a theory point of view, nothing else is required. It would be a limited system, but it would work. Wait, Jeff, could you, um, could we dig into this idea of like the single column neocortex just for a second here? Sure. Uh, when I think of that, and when I think of like a single cortical column as making models of its inputs in this hypothetical single column neocortex, that those models would be sort of the lowest level of input, right? They wouldn't be of entirely complete objects like that. No. Why, why would they, why, why wouldn't they be complete objects? In this paper, we showed how, uh, and, and this in the comms plus paper, we show how a single column can learn hundreds of complete objects. Um, they basically just have to learn them in, in this very simple example, they're learning the morphology uh, of the shape of the object. It's a three-dimensional model. And um, it's complete. I'm not, when I say complete, I, I'm not saying everything that we know about the world of coffee cups, it's, just, it's, 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 it's complete in its own right, right? It's, it's not like I only know features, I don't know coffee cups. It's, no, there is a structured form of this information, which is a predictive model in the column. Um, and it's not just some feature extractor that someone else is gonna use to do something with. Okay. It's like a little CAD model inside of each column. Yeah. Was that, was that your question, Alex? Yeah, no, that was kind of my question. I guess, um, yeah, that, that does kind of fly in the face of my intuition here uh, with how, like, for example, like columns in V1, uh, when I think of a column in V1, for example, being able to understand what it's going to expect when you look at a coffee cup, I think of that signal of a coffee cup coming in from other, like, higher level areas or something like that. <laughs> yes. But, well, that's what everyone thinks but right. we're saying this is not the case a single cortical column has all these complete objects yes yes that. now i am oh, by the way i you know it may not be worth anything to you but i'm very very confident with it. so i realize this is flies in the face of what people thought but what people thought really didn't make any sense either no one had any idea where how anywhere in the in you know if you ask a neuroscientist where in the brain is the structure of a coffee cup stored they wouldn't be able to answer that question. They would say, well, you got these features coming in, they're processed, they're passed up the hierarchy, and someplace they assembled into some model of the coffee cup. And what Mountcastle told us, it's the most amazing discovery, and it's true, is that the columns are all doing the same thing. So if the cortex is going to learn a coffee cup, model of a coffee cup, model of something someplace, it's going to learn models everywhere. Uh, anyway, this, the, the whole point of this thought experiment here explained how this happened. It explained for the first time, there was a neural explanation for how the morphology of an object could be learned. There was, a, prior to this, there was, as far as I know, in the neocortex, there were, there were no theories of this whatsoever. It was a very hand-waving idea that, well, features are extracted and they're extracted and, and, and then eventually you get this model. And of course, that's how artificial neural networks work today. And so people say, well, look, it works. But these artificial neural networks don't really have a model of the object in the sense that we would call a three-dimensional structural model and understand how it moves and how it behaves and things like that. It's a, it's a very uh, shallow statistical model, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the big idea. That's why I said, in number one, under the columns paper, we introduced this really big idea, which is that each and every column learns complete models. And by complete, I mean sensory motor structured model using a reference frame. So, you know, the morphology of an object, think of it that way. It can learn the shape of a coffee cup, a single column. Okay, gotcha. But, uh, are we ruling out that both might be happening? Uh, each cortical column learns a complete model of the world, but it's also input to another cortical column that can use that representation for its own comprehension. No, I mean, we're not ruling out the idea that the input to another cortical column could be output of one cortical column. If that's what you're saying, Lucas. Yeah, yeah. No, we're not willing to that back. In fact, that's a, almost a fact. It's a certainty. 
um, not all cortical columns get input from the eyes or the ears or any sensor. Uh, and they get input from other things, but all cortical columns are learning models. It's just what is their input it can vary, right? One can get input from the eyes, a patch of the retina, another can input from a patch of the skin, another can get input from a patch of another region of cortex. So um, th there is still a hierarchy of, or a, a, a type of hierarchy that's going on in the cortex. The connections, um, we talked about briefly going through the thalamus represent that. Um, but uh, it's, it's not denying that there isn't any hierarchical structure to the cortex. It's just saying that every column is a complete modeling system and it will do the best it can to model that input uh, given whatever input it has. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I sense the idea that we're saying that every column learns everything or something like that. No, it's not at all like that. It's just that every column can learn complete models. And again, complete means structured, predictive, sensory motor models. It doesn't mean complete as in all knowledge. It just means it's not, it's, it's structured, it's structured knowledge. These are great questions. Any others? All right, I'm gonna go on. So what we did is our next paper um, is we try to address three of these components. We tried to represent, address how neurons could represent reference frames and locations. Uh, we tried to address how um, a column can learn composite objects, meaning a, a motorcycle is not just a bunch of features, it's a wheels and a frame and pedals and so on in a particular arrangement. And we tried to address how uh, a column can learn object behaviors. That, those are the only three things we attacked in our next paper. None of the other things. This is the framework paper, which came out in January 2019. And it has, um, a set of, um, let me hide these controls again. It had uh, a set of new claims that were pretty big. The first one is we argued that every column in the neocortex uses grid cells to represent location. So in our previous paper, we said, hey, the column knows the location of, of a, a sensor relative to the object being sensed. We didn't know how it was going to hear. Now we said, it's going to be grid cells. Uh, oh, we had the, are you kind of combining the columns plus paper into this as well? Well, the columns plus paper actually came out after the framework paper. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <Three> months, <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> three months, three or four months later, or something like that. Anyway, okay. I, I wasn't going to go through the columns plus paper carefully. What the columns plus paper, I interpreted as it was, it was, it was following up on the, on the, the paper I just talked about a moment ago, the comms paper with simulation, mathematical analysis, um, et cetera. Um, it, it was, uh, I don't know if it introduced any new big ideas at, the, at that paper. Uh, um, but anyway, this is the next paper that came out. So, so this idea that grid cells, of course, grid cells are very well known in other parts of the brain, in the entorhinal cortex. Uh, and but uh, it, it, what we proposed is we didn't know of any evidence, and we didn't know of it, there was some, but we didn't know it, uh, any evidence that grid cells would exist in the neocortex. And we not only said they would be found in the neocortex, we said they'd be found in every single cortical column. And that this was a core feature of cortical columns and core feature of the neocortex. That is a big idea. Um, and it certainly was, again, a surprising prediction. Now, it's not terribly surprising because we know grid cells exist in the entorhinal cortex. And so it's not like it, it, it's unknown thing, but at the, this point, we didn't know about any evidence otherwise. It turned out there was some, we didn't know about it. Um, and now there's, there's more and more evidence coming out about this. And this is uh, almost certainly true, uh, this, this uh, claim in this paper. And so we went further than grid cells. Um, in the, grid cells are found in the entorhinal cortex and the whole hippocampal entorhinal cortex complex has been studied a lot. Um, and there's a whole bunch of types of cells in there and mechanisms that are very well studied. 
And there are place cells, there's grid cells, there's these type of vector cells, there's head direction cells and so on. And we made the proposal in the, in the framework paper that many of those mechanisms would be recreated in cortex. It wasn't just grid cells. It, we said, that, you know, there's, a, there's an ensemble of things that are going on over in the, in the hippocampal complex. We think a good portion of them are actually implemented in every cortical column. Uh, and we made this analogy between, you know, um, a rat moving around in a maze or moving in a box and how place cells and grid cells and vector cells behave and how your finger moving around in a coffee cup. And we said they're pretty equivalent and analogous. We're not saying it's exactly the same. They're different neural tissue, right? They don't look exactly the same. Um, but we said those, it, it's that there's an ensemble of cell types that work together to, to build a model of rooms and environments. We said a good portion of that ensemble of cell types would exist in every quarter of a column, but we specifically called out grid cells. We also, uh, we, we adopted a proposal, and I don't remember who was first proposed it, I'm sure Marcus or Subita would remember, that, that there would have to be multiple grid cell modules because an individual grid cell module is, um, is not sufficient to represent a location of any high fidelity. But if you have multiple grid cell modules, as shown in this um, upper right figure here, that shows two grid cell modules, a green one and a red one, that are slightly different scale or different, slightly different orientation. If you read cells from both of them or multiple ones at the same time, you get a much higher um, resolution representation of space. And um, so we said, okay, we propose multiple grid cell modules represent the location of a sensor. I, we now believe that's probably wrong. Uh, we'll get into that in a moment. Um, and what this did, it was interesting, is that when you, when you formed a representation of an object, uh, a location, sorry, excuse me, every location was unique. That is, there wasn't a common location like, uh, you know, one, one, you know, one, 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 or two, four, six, or something like that, it would apply to every object. The neural representation for locations were unique for the object and the location. So it's a very, and it was all these really cool things that came out of that. Um, anyway, that was one proposal. Columns use grid cells to represent location, but that was really a bigger thing. The second thing, um, my slides don't always be close here. We proposed a mechanism for compositionality. This is, was a really hard problem. And the idea, the example we used was the logo on the coffee cup, right? When you learn a coffee cup with a mental logo, you don't have to relearn the logo. You can just look at it and go, oh, there's a logo on this cup, I'm done. That's a new cup, <laughs> I got it, right? So clearly, We've taken something we've known before, the, an object called the Nemento logo, which is a previously learned object, and we've taken something, a coffee cup, which is a previously learned object, and we're able to link them together in a very fast, efficient means uh, to form a new compositional object. And we knew at this time that pretty much all objects were composed of compositions of other objects. That's kind of the way it works. That's the way the world is structured. In fact, I think I even talked about this in Unintelligent. Um, but um, so how would that happen? It was really tr tricky to understand. And I, uh, a number of momentums went out and came back. And I, 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 was, I don't know who actually did the work with the Marcus or most probably with Marcus, but you know, a bunch of people came back and said, we have a proposal. <laughs> and um, it was really cool. Uh, and the proposal, I won't walk you through the details of it. Um, it I, we don't want to do that today. It's complex and, and it's probably not right. Uh, so. Um, but we came up with this idea that there were not only grid cell modules, but there were the displacement cell modules. And uh, individual displacement cell modules would sort of represent the, 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 the displacement between one reference frame and another. And if you had a set of them, um, then uh, you, would have, you, see, you could very rapidly form a representation of where is the Nometa logo relative to the coffee cup. And this is where we first started introducing attention to Vivian. The idea here is, was the idea is if you attend to one object like the coffee cup, and then you attend to the other object like the Nementa logo, or any two objects, that the displacement cells would automatically, every time, calculate the displacement between those two objects. So as you go around the world attending to things, and which is what you do all the time, whether you're wherever it or not, you're going around looking at little things all the time, one after another, um, that your brain is constantly determining the relative position of those objects to each other. So as you tend to one object, then another, displacement's automatically calculated. That's just really cool. And um, most people aren't even talking about how neurons could do this at all. Uh, and we now had a neural mechanism for how it would happen. 
We also then propose a mechanism for learning how objects behave. We use the example of the stapler. And the, I, it's a very simple concept. The stapler essentially has multiple components. Um, and some of those components move relative to other components. And so the displacement of the top of the stapler to, the, to when it's open, to, the displacement of the top of the stapler to the bottom of the stapler changes as you open it this way. And that's just going to go through a series of displacement cells activations because this is at one displacement, this is another, and these are in between. And this is just a sequence. And, and we could use our sequence memory in its original form, in some sense, to just learn a sequence of displacements. And that would be uh, representing how the components of an object move relative to each other over time. And that is what the definition of object behaviors are and um, how things are changing, not just how they move, but how they change over time. So we had a proposed mechanism for that, which is really cool. Um, and, um, and and the idea that you're tending to these one at a time and you build up these uh, uh, compositional structures. We also introduced the term thousand brain theory. And the, 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 the big idea behind that is we made a very weak, but we still made the argument, but not with a lot of force to it, um, that these mechanisms for learning compositional structure through movement and learning how objects behave um, uh, over time, that they apply to all parts of the neocortex, and therefore they apply to all parts of cognition. That everything we do um, is going to be built on these, everything we think about is high level thinking and planning and language is going to be built on these same basic mechanisms. Because if these mechanisms are in one column, they're in all these columns. And um, we couldn't really make it, it's hard to make that, but that was a very, very top down theoretical argument for that. Um, um, Doing this paper, we introduced new problems. <laughs> so let me go through the new problems that we, we introduced. Uh, it required too many grid cell modules. Get this to work, you had to have a whole bunch of grid cell modules, not like hundreds, but you have to have at least, you know, eight or 10, ideally 20. Um, and that didn't seem possible for a lot of reasons. I won't go through the reasons why, um, but it just didn't seem right. Uh, and there was no evidence that this was happening was very little evidence that that was a similar type of thing was happening over the antirhinal cortex. So that seemed to be a problem. The splice themselves had many limitations. Although they're really cool the way they work, they didn't really work for most situations. Um, they had no way of handling scale, meaning like representing the size of the mental logo, if it was smaller or larger. It just had no capability of doing that. It did not have the ability to represent the orientation of the mental logo on the coffee cup. So if the, if the logo was angled at 45 degrees, displacement cells could not handle that. There's no concept of that. Um, it didn't have the ability to handle distortions. So the Nometa logo, it sort of wraps around the cup. It's no longer its original shape. And that's a, that's a simple example of, of a problem that occurs in a lot of situations. You know, you can take an existing object and distort it and form a new object and, and in a very simple way. And, you know, it just, it, there was no explanation for that, you know, and, and so we could learn, we, we knew we could learn these things very quickly. I could learn, you know, a coffee cup with this small logo or a big logo or an angle the one way or the other, just, just as fast as I could learn it if I didn't do those things. And yet we had no way of, under, oops, no way of understanding that. So that was the displacement cells didn't really work too well. Um, we didn't even know how grid cells could work in 3D. Um, you know, that was a big question. Uh, in, as are typically described in the antirhinal cortex, they don't work in 3D. We need 3D representations. Uh, Mercus, uh, Mercus, <laughs> Marcus and Mirko and others uh, wrote a, a, a nice little paper about this, where you, you could have a lot of grid cell modules and showed how they could represent uh, n-dimensional spaces. Um, but again, it requires a lot of grid cell modules, and we don't think there's really a possibility for a lot of grid cell modules in a particular cortex cortical column. Um, we then exposed the problem we knew earlier, but we now kind of exposed it more here. We said, okay, imagine look at this upper left-hand corner, this picture up in the left-hand corner. We said, oh, we have this location layer made of multiple grid cell modules. That's what these little trapezoidal things are representing. And um, it's getting some motor input that updates this, this information. So like, okay, well, how does that movement detected? And where does it come from? And how does it update location and orientation and all these things? It's like, we know there's like a big hole over here <laughs> on the left, so we didn't really address uh, in this paper. Uh, 
There, I'm sure there are other ones. And of course, we had our previous shortcomings, um, which we didn't address. This, this paper, or the framework paper, we still didn't model, talk about how we handled the orientation of the sensor in the world. Uh, we still didn't solve the problem of vision, which is sensing at a distance. Um, we uh, still didn't really deal with all the issues of voting, and um, we didn't include motor generation, and again, no transfer learning or the disjoint pooling thing. Uh, so those were not attempted here. So we still had a big list of, of issues. Now, let's stop here again and uh, do the same exercise we did before. Kudos for the first person to ask the question that they don't understand something. Well, one thing, that, not so much a question, but just kind of a look behind the curtains, like on the research side here, um, often in these, when these things come up, these flaws, we know about these flaws from day one. It's like, I, I'm like, hey, look, displacement cells can do, uh, can do compositions, uh, but it's not going to handle scale and orientation. But this, but what they can do is so cool. Let's explore it for a while. And, and so often these all of these cases where like just pointing out there's like a flaw in it afterward it's like we knew about the flaw from day one but we we decided to just run with it for a while and see if the flaws would work themselves out and that's often a good that's the case here that's a good point marcus and in fact in our papers we often called them out uh we called out the fact that we didn't understand orientation and we called out some of these things um but you're right i mean most of these things we kind of knew but it was it was like but we did know, and we just said, but these are these ideas are so important anyway. So they like take displacement cells. I, I agree, it was a really cool idea. It is a cool idea. And it is like the first attempt at even solving a problem, a fundamental problem that most people don't even think about. And, and so it's worth putting it out there because it shows that what the problem is, it shows the nature of the problem. It shows you might be able to solve it. He, neurons could do these things. Yeah, and, and so, yes, that's why we did it. It's not like, oh, it's a bad idea. No, it's a great idea. It's just, okay, it's not working quite right yet. <laughs> you know? And we'll get to in a moment, you know, Marcus has taken the displacement idea in his new work and, and probably fixed it. So, um, so it was a great idea. <laughs> but good point. All right, more questions, concerns? Um, I don't know if this is important for people to understand or not, but I don't, my guess is most people here don't understand how multiple grid cell modules represent locations of sensors. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, most neuroscientists that I've spoken to, even those who study grid cell modules often don't understand this concept. So it's- uh, but we don't we don't really believe it anymore. Yeah, so that's I'm, what I'm, I'm not that's sure. What I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't know if it's important or not, but I'm pretty sure people don't understand this. Well, I I don't think you need Is to it, understand. It, it, it's it's important only in the sense that it, it exposes some very interesting theoretical concepts. Um, and it's and and grid cells work on the. I mean, displacement cells also work on those very interesting theoretical concepts. So. It's, uh, I touched on one of them, the idea that like locations can be unique per object. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we think about like if I would design a CAD system, I would use a Cartesian coordinate system and I would say, okay, everybody's going to have its same Cartesian coordinate system. It has a zero point and, you know, but in grid cells, it doesn't work like that. In these, in these models, these, every, every representational location is unique in the universe. <laughs> so, I mean, these really interesting ideas, but I don't think it's important to understand the mechanism very well at this point because we're not going to be using it going forward. So I'm not, I don't see if you disagree with that, whether we should go into it or not. I don't know. No, no, that's why I asked. That's why I said, you know, I don't know if people need to do it. It's just that oh. a lot of the concepts on this slide kind of rely on that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even for myself, of course, still don't quite understand if we're not using multiple grid cell modules, how is the whole thing going to? You know, hang together. That's still yeah. not clear to me. Yeah. Well, I'm going to touch on that in the next slide, um, but um, but let's not go there yet. I think it's important for people to understand what these problems are, um, and um, at least have some intuition about them, or at least understood what I said about them. I have a question about number three here. Um, this mechanism for learning object behaviors. Yeah. Um, I guess this ties into my like original thesis statement uh, the other day of like not doing vision, but this this is like a very visual example, and it makes sense with the stapler where you have something that's physically moving, and you can represent that as displacements. But I guess 
Uh, I'm wondering about maybe more abstract kind of behaviors like changing color or something. Would you expect sort of the same representation? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It, it changing. Uh, um, again, take for example, um, uh, using a smartphone. Mm -hmm. All right. The morphology of the smartphone does not change as you use the smartphone. So the location of things don't change really. Uh, what mostly changes what's active in locations on the smartphone. Mm -hmm. So what's on your screen, you know, oh, I can have an icon, the icon could move, but more likely the icon just changes or something else pops up. And so you have a model, if, if you think about a model of a set of objects relative to each other um, at some position, one way that model movement could be expressed is like the stapler, like it's physically moving. Another way is that the, the thing that's at some displacement, like, oh, there's this icon at, at a relative position to another icon, well, the thing that's actually there could change, right? <laughs> it can become something new. Uh, it's the same basic idea. You have a model, but the model has to have different states where the, the displacement and content of the different components um, are changing. And I think that covers all possible um, behaviors. Uh, yeah, okay, that makes sense to me. Thinking of this instead of, like instead of just physical displacement as maybe something equivalent to some kind of state transition. And that's yeah. very general. But we need to do both. I mean, you know, just if you solve one and not the other, then you haven't solved the problem. Uh, I always felt that the that the physical movement, like the staple one, was harder for me. It was hard for me to figure out. So that's why I wanted to work on that one. Um, um, you know, there's a how a neurons would represent that kind of thing. It's really hard to imagine how neurons could do that. Um, where you could easily, it's, you might come up with simpler explanations for like, oh, how does the color of something change? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's how it felt to me. But you're right, it's both of those. Okay. It is what, it's, if, you think, if you think of the world as a compositional structure, it's what are the components and what are the relationships to each other? And a single object, like a stapler or, or a smart, smartphone, can change the components and change the relationship to each other, and yet we still think it's the same thing. And um, we don't think the smartphone is a new smartphone because I have a different app on the display. And I don't think this is a new physical object on my desk because the stapler is open. Um, so uh, then we have to, that's the general, that is the general problem of how we, you know, a very fundamental problem of like, how do you represent these different things? And sometimes there is a trajectory to the movement, right? If I just, if I change the icon on my display, you know, maybe the, my, my, display is I cycling through um, pictures. Well, I don't have to do anything. It just happens. Um, but, but often there's an interaction with the user as well. You know, you have to touch it and it does this and things like that. And so there's, 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 that all has to be represented somehow. Right. Is it, is it a cardinal mistake to just simply, uh, in, in my head at least, equate displacement cells and movement? Because to me, it seems like, uh, do we really need to, to have something like that? Or can we just say this is actually equivalent to movement? Well, well, I use the, mo the word movement, and I'll, very specifically, I'm, I'm referring to movement of movement of your body or your sensor. That's the movement I'm referring to. So when I like, you know, when I talk about movement, I'm, I'm talking about, um, you know, like your eyes are moving or your fingers moving. This is a property of the model. This displacement is a property of the, the physical world. And um, as we just talked about, it could be a color change or an icon change. Or it doesn't have to be physical movement. Um, so anyway, one is a property of a model of something and the other is like your physical body moving through space. So you could call this movement if you want, but don't confuse it with the other kind of movement. To represent the stapler or the iPhone the icon on your displays, you have to have a model of that object. That model has to be independent of your current position with it. It's a, it's a property of the object itself and it has nothing to do with how your body's moving. It's how the object is moving. So different, how your body moving is usually a temporary thing, right? It's like, oh, I can touch the screen with my left finger or my right finger, but, how the cell phone operates is not. It's a property of the cell phone and it's consistent from day to day. Did that help? Mm -hmm.
Other questions? Uh, Vivian. Yeah, I'm not really sure yet how to phrase this question best. Um, I guess I still struggle a bit with understanding how, how the object behaviors are represented. So if I see an object and the immediately recognize some affordances, for instance, is this like part of the voting signal, like additional to the object ID or is this- Well, we're still uh, talking, we're still talking one thought? column here. We're mm -hmm. conceptually, we're talking one column, Vivian. We haven't gone to voting yet uh, here. That if a, if, a mo if a column is gonna model an object, it has to model its behaviors as well. This is not something that's going to happen elsewhere. So voting is not part of this yet. Voting would be important maybe for learning in a practical system, but at the moment, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about single columns. So our, our, our argument that all these properties exist in, in a single column. So is the um, corresponding behavior modeled, like part of the model over time or is it like an instantaneous, I don't really know how to express well, it. Well, it is like, over time, yes. Oh, it can do this and that. And it, I know it, at this point in time, I don't need to extrapolate into the future to model this movement. Well, I, I missed the last part of your question, but I mean, the first part, it is over time. Obviously, a, a, an object doesn't exist in multiple states at the same time, at least not outside of quantum theory. And uh, so, um, you know, um, so, and in some cases, like, like the stapler opening up, there's a physical movement that's gonna happen at some rate, you know, things like that. The changing of the icons on your display happens instantaneously, perceptually. So, um, but it's always over time in the sense that there's a sequential um, uh, pattern. So I'm not sure, and I didn't hear the second part of your question. Yeah, I, I guess it would be if I see the stapler now and I instantaneously know I can open up the stapler, is this like an instantaneous part of the model that I know this is a one type of behavior that well, I can first do? Of all, you, you'd have to learn model. this, right? You, you'd have to learn it. You, you just wouldn't know it. If, if, if you've never seen anything like this at all, it's the first time you've seen anything. You're a column, you're just seeing something for the first time and you're, you're exploring it, let's say your finger and you're touching it and you're moving around you're gonna learn the morphology of it. You wouldn't know that it can open until it opens or you push on it and it changes or something like that. Um, so it's not like you just instantly know this. Maybe the stapler doesn't open. Maybe, you know, who knows? I mean, these are all these behaviors have to be learned. Now, obviously, if you've seen similar things, we could talk about analogy, how you might deduce that the stapler could open or how you might deduce how the cell phone would behave. But a priori, if you didn't know anything, you just have to learn it. You'd have to, be, you'd have to experience it. Um, and it would have to be learned. And then it would become part of the model of the object. It's just a very conceptual idea. You have a model of something, that model includes its morphology, its features, how it behaves over time. Uh, if it has behaviors over time, not if you don't, every object does. Um, and, and, and these are just point examples, the stapler or the iPhone or the smartphone. It's just, just examples of the kind of things the behaviors might manifest themselves as. Does that help? I'm not sure if I helped you on that. Yeah, I think I'm just having trouble uh, phrasing it right. So, so I'm assuming I already learned it, but I think I know. So, is it correct to say that this model is basically encoding in the pre encoded in the predictions of the neurons that they make? Um, um, it's it's think about the model before, like the, the one we had from the previous page, which was just like it features at locations, all right? Features at locations. That, that was a very simple model. It didn't include any behaviors or anything like that. And 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 so you have like oh, there's this feature at this location, this feature at that location, this sense feature, sense feature at this location, and so on. Well, it's a predictive model in the sense that if you move your finger to a new location, the model will predict what you'll feel. You say, okay, if I go this way, I'll feel this. If I go that way, I'll feel that. Well, now we're just extending the model to say, like, well, maybe if I push on this location, then the relative displacement of the components will change. So if I push down on the top of the stapler, it's going to move and it's going to spring back. So it's, it's not like the model just making a prediction. It's more like 
if you were to execute something like the stapler, it's not going to do anything on its own. So with the stapler, the model would say, well, if I were to push on the top, it would go down, the stapler would come out. But if I don't imagine pushing down on the stapler, then the model is silent in the background. It doesn't say anything. It's, it's not making a prediction. It only makes a prediction when you actually think about moving your finger and pushing down on the top. It doesn't, you know, while I'm doing that, it's not predicting, you know, that, you know, the, the rubber feet are going to not slide or something. I don't know what it is. You know, it's, it's just like it's a momentary, momentary thing. It's the model is sitting there silent in the background. It's stored knowledge. And as your as your sensor moves through the world, your finger, for example, uh, moves through the world and, and interacts. With, it basically invokes the different parts of the model. And the model says, oh, well, if you press here, this will happen. Or you'll feel this. Uh, and if you press here, you'll feel something else. Um, that kind of thing. Okay, yeah, I help? think, yeah, I, I think it, I understand. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you don't, I don't know. Um, other questions? All right, I have two more slides. They may or may not be longer. <laughs> oh, maybe I have three more slides, sorry about that. Oh, but no, but no, two more slides. All right, so what is this picture? This is not, this is a, uh, a flow diagram, okay? It's not like color to color. This is not like layers of cells or anything like that. This is a more of a flow diagram. And I want to sort of point out where we are currently working on these issues. What are we up to, right? How are we trying to solve these issues that I've just identified? So let's just talk about the model of the object. Uh, Marcus is, has sort of proposed a new way of thinking about modeling the object. And Part of it's new and part of it's not new. So his, and Marcus, correct me if I get any of this wrong, okay? Because I'm doing this from memory, not from recent experience. Um, so he's saying, look, let's just go all out. A model is a set of displacements of sub objects. And he's now referring to it as a graph. Great, okay, it's a graph. But it is essentially, this sub object is at some position relative to this subject, which relative to this sub object and so on. We've totally abandoned the, any idea that there's any kind of features at location. That doesn't exist. Now, I think, in my mind, the big idea that Marcus came up here was that the displacements are not based on grid cell modules, as in the framework paper, but are based on a type of cell called the, these vector cells. And vector cells, if you're not familiar, and probably most of you won't be, there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, you can think of them more like they represent polar coordinates versus grid cells maybe represent Cartesian coordinates. A vector cell represents something at some angle and some distance, something like that. And uh, so the basic idea, very high level, I think, again, Marcus, please correct me, is that we're taking the displacement cell concept, but now the displacements are in these polar coordinates or in these vector cells, as opposed to the more, uh, 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 Cartesian type coordinates you would get from a grid cell module. And um, again, because the model is based on displacements, it is still, it should be amenable to learning behavior. Although I don't think Marcus has talked about that, but the key of learning behaviors is to learn sequences of displacements. And since we still have displacements, well, then we should be able to do that. That's a pretty big change um, in how to think about modeling, is, is he introduced these vector cells, which there are many of them. And we had we totally ignored them in the past because we didn't know what to make of them. And so now that we run the limit of grid cells and grid cells don't seem to work, <laughs> he says, hey, maybe these vector cells can solve this problem. Um, there's more to it, but Marcus, did I misrepresent anything right then? No, that's all accurate. And I, I do think you, you explained kind of, um... You say you said earlier we as theorists we choose like the extreme thing where reality might be a little more complicated. At some point in the future, we might bring back some notion of maybe a location, but right now the extreme version of this is the yeah, let's throw out the locations and, and talk completely about displacement. Great, I am happy I got that right. Okay, there's another idea that um, that it's kind of been we, we've been dealing with for quite a while, but I think Marcus made it more explicit here, which is great. And this is and this has to get back with the idea. I told you, remember, none of our models worked with vision. Right? We had no explanation how an eye, which is not actually touching the coffee cup, you know, the finger is at the coffee cup, but the eye is not at the coffee cup. So how do we handle that, right? 
So we've introduced, or uh, you know, the idea that there's a pose of the sensor. The sensor is 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 at some location in orientation relative to the object that's being sensed. It's not at the location on the object. Uh, we're not even thinking about that. It's at some it's 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 at some uh, you know distance or location in orientation. And and there's still a role for grid cells. Um, grid cells again. I'm, I think I'm trying to understand what Marcus had proposed. I think this is it. Is that grid cells are still used for path integration of the location of the sensor, uh, but it's more like a temporary scratch pad. It's not like the basic um, fundamental representation scheme in the column. It's like, oh, we have a grid cell because when I move, I have to know where my finger is going to be. So let's figure that out using grid cells. Um, but it's and but grid cells aren't this permanent reference frame of high fidelity. They don't have to be high fidelity. They just have to work good enough for this path integration at the moment. Um, and, uh, and then uh, we'll use them again later. And, and this gives us the ability to sort of get rid of the idea you need to have lots of grid cells and, and a bunch of other issues associated with them. Um, but they're still there and we're still gonna find them in every protocol column, but they're playing a different role. They're playing a more of a temporary path integration role uh, it's not fundamental to the representation of the object model itself. The, you'll see no grid cell representations in the model, uh, as we did in our in our columns paper, where the location and feature were part of the model. Here, the location is not part of the model. Um, it's only the relative positions of the different components. But we still need to track the sensor, its movement, its pose to the object, uh, as your as your fingers moving through space or your eyes are moving around and things like that. Um, and there may not, we don't really understand this yet, unless Marcus has figured it out, there, there may not really be an object-wide reference frame anymore. We don't really understand this. Uh, um, it could be very temporary um, and, and used um, moment to moment. And I, I was encouraged by this idea because that was that paper we saw of the rats, uh, the bats flying in the long tunnel and the grid cells remap, uh, their size and scale changed throughout the, the, tra the traversing of the, of the, of the tunnel and it was like, wow, they can't really then rep rep representing a reference frame for the tunnel. They have to be sort of temporarily used for different things. And um, so there's this idea that, you know, we throw out this whole object-wide reference frame. Uh, Marcus, anything you want to say about that before I go on? Oh, uh, no, that was a good summary. <laughs> well, I'm really pleased. <laughs> um, I, I, I do have one question. Uh, sure. So we know grid cells, I mean, Exist in entero cortex. They're, they're they're at least in some sense. There's a morphology where you can place them. When you said that you didn't know what to do with vector cells, do vector cells exist as a concept, or is this a imputed? They must be vector cells. Oh, there 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 are lots of them. They they're detected. They're very well characterized. Um, they they exist. They're perhaps even better understood than grid cells. Um, uh, there's various how types they, uh, of them. So they're how physical. They find them? This is the same techniques they find anything else. They find cells, they record from them, they see what makes the cells respond, and they test that and come up with all kinds of theories and test it again. Um, we could go through that. It, it would be maybe a useful exercise sometime to, to review the, the, the literature on these things. We have done a, a paper review on this. It was, I think we had a couple of review papers about. Um, Vector cells, object vector cells, and other types of vector cells. Um, so, yeah, but maybe you weren't here, Kevin. I don't know. Um, but there's a lot that's yeah. known about them. Uh, so, uh, just one last question: Are they? I mean, uh, the grid cells were first kind of found or or, or modeled in the interorganal cortex. Uh, are vector cells found? Were they found in a particular? Uh, they're in the uh, same. Uh, they're in the same alarm. area. They're they're in the antimonic cortex. Um, I don't know if they're anywhere else, Marcus. Where else are they found? Yeah, they're around. Um, <laughs> they're the, around. The, <laughs> but the the ones that um, the, the the kind of idealized ones, like the object vector cells that respond to lots of different objects, those are an antimonic cortex. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. They're kind of in, it, the way to think of it is the way I kind of think of it. Maybe it's not the right way to think of it. The way I think about it, it between the hippocampus and the subiculum and the entomonic cortex, and then there's medial entomonic cortex, there's lateral entomonic cortex, there's all these different subsections. You can, you can get pretty far for just ignoring where the actual cells are. 
it's not that helpful all the time. It, they're all kind of working together. They're highly interconnected. And so you can, you know, often I just say, yeah, it doesn't really matter where you find exactly where you find these cells because we have to understand what they're doing. And um, just knowing where they are is, is interesting, but it doesn't, it doesn't always tell you much too much. <laughs> um, well, but, I, I, was just, I was just trying to figure out whether they were localized in a particular body or they, they are, they're localized to different sections, just like red cells are localized <clears> and, and head direction, you know, head direction cells we find everywhere. So. Okay, so are you are you are just what are you going to make the leap then uh, where we're looking to find grid cell like behavior in the, uh, the neocortex? Or are you going to look for vector like so? Well, we, we are going to find grid cell like behavior in the neocortex, and it has been found and it will continue to be found. So the theory still says there has to be grid cells everywhere. They're just no, serving no I, I, I'm saying, well, are you yeah. going to extend also to say vector well, cells are? Well, we haven't published anything on this yet, but I think that would be a logical thing in a paper about this to say, yes, well, we, internally, we'd say, yes, we would, we would, according to you know, the latest modeling that Marcus has come up with, that we'd expect, expect to see um, various flavors of, of vector cells in the cortex. Okay. Um, and that, that would be, again, another strong prediction. And I guess we could say it right now, we're making that prediction, right? Uh, uh, that's a very strong prediction in the sense it, it would be surprising and, um, and verifiable. So uh, that is a strong prediction of, uh, of Marcus's idea that displacements are now based on um, vector cells. I have a question on, on this uh, temporary map. Do, do we understand grid cell, they require an anchor, an anchor point. Does it, this temporary map requires an anchor point? Uh, the, does what require an anchor point? The, the scratch pad. Uh, well, it, well, it's not, an anchor point isn't the right term, perhaps, just be clear. They have to be anchored or re-anchored, meaning they, the, so it just, so everyone, I know you know this, Lucas, uh, um, Lewis, but other people may not. A, a grid cell module is a bunch of cells, and at one point, only a few of them are active, a bump, a bump of active cells, it's the small section of those cells are active. And when you when you infer an object or you see something, the 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 brain has to figure out which bump should be active, like where where should the activity bump be, and that's called anchoring. It's like and once you anchor, we need called anchoring because once you start attending to a particular object, that point then moves through path integration. It doesn't get re-anchored again. And so, well, it does practically, but not conceptually. Um, so. You're asking, do we still need to re-anchor for these? And I think, yes, I would think you would. I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't re-anchor, um, but it may just be one grid cell module. It, it could be just one grid cell module. That would be the evidence we have that a column has one grid cell module and that grid cell module would be re-anchored under, uh, I would assume so, because that's the way they work in the antoronic cortex. And I'm assuming they're gonna work that way in the cortex too. So they would be re-anchored. Um, uh, yeah, here, I'll, I'll jump in because, like, here though, I think the word scratch pad might actually be conveying a wrong mental oh, sorry. here. <laughs> just, well, just like, sometimes we use that word, but here, uh, this this is like one of the questions of grid cells is that it could have been a scratch pad. It could have been the case that if an animal comes into a room, uh, it doesn't matter which grid cells are active. It just it's it's this path integrating system. Next time it comes into that room, maybe a different grid cell is active for a location. That would be a true scratch pad. Oh, I see. Like a, a true scratch pad would be like that. Uh, here, there there is some memory component. Um, that oh. there is like uh, here the the same grid cell is going to become active when the rat comes back into a room, which is an interesting vital fact. Like it, it could have been different from that. So um, so that is an important detail. So I think of it more as um, the grid cells are providing additional spatial information that was somehow not captured by the vector cells. Uh, well, I think I think what they do, the vector cells will not be good at path integrating in um, in linear movement in some sense. You know, right. uh, uh, so I, here I changed. It. That's a very good point, uh, Lewis. So I, I added here. I said like a temporary scratch pad with anchoring. <laughs> if that helps at all. <laughs> that helps. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize it. that might be confusing. Um, uh, I haven't gone to the third box here yet. Any questions still on the first two? Again, let me just review again before I give you a chance. 
big idea is that we now are going to model objects completely as displacements. We've just we've we've accepted that completely. We abandoned the idea of sensor features at locations. Displacements are now based on vector polar coordinates versus Cartesian coordinates. That's that's a, a really nice idea. Um, and uh, and now we've we've sort of uh, introduced the idea that a sensor is not at the location. Doesn't have to be at a location on the object. To sense something, it's it's at some pose to the object, and we will how, now have to do various kind of calculations to determine the displacements of two sub objects when my sensor is at a distance. So my eye is two feet away from the things I'm looking at. I have to be able to calculate the displacement between those two things as I attend to them one after another, and I have to incorporate the pose of the eye relative to the object I'm viewing or the object I'm viewing. So those are the big ideas, uh, and then and as I said, you know. Grid cells are still there, but they're not playing the same role as before. And you're you're using the extreme language of we're abandoning features at locations. Um, in my in my mind, it's a little bit of a slightly weaker statement where uh, the grid cells are more like on the side and important, where but the vector cells are the central part. So it's like the um, okay. So 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 the vector cells are there, but it may be the case that features are that it may be the case that. Uh, the things you learn, the parts of an object you learn, do have something location-y associated with them. So, so, so they do have something grid cell-like associated. Well, with them. Eventually you but, have to, I, if possible, do you have a reason to believe that, Mark? The fact that grid cells, <laughs> the thing we just talked about with Lewis, the fact that grid cells do anchor to environments suggests that like mm. they do get associated with things. I see. Well, so, they certainly get associated with the particular object you're doing. Um, yeah. Well, I, I would. I, I'm open to some kind of strange hybrid approach. I, 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 I would, my I argument for that, this is a little bit off topic for most people here, but um, my argument for that would be that you still need to re anchor the grid cell modules as you path integrate. And you're going to need to use sensory information for that. And that has to be learned. So there has to be a, a learned component, object specific component to the grid cells, uh, even to do path integration. But that doesn't mean the model is taking advantage. Of it. it just means that the, the path integration methodology has to be uh, has to learn the particular 